But I'm recording. I'm recording as well. Boy, I'm so recording. You wouldn't believe how much I'm recording. <laughs> <laughs> how can I? 20 ma ways to derail our debate uh, recording in the first few seconds. Let's see. It reminds me of a, of an ad for the, I think the Metro in Melbourne, Australia. And it's all the stupid ways to die when you're at the Metro station and it's using cartoons. Look it up, look it up on YouTube and you have like just silly ways, but real ways that you can die. Um, and I don't think it's just for the Metro, but it's the, the point is, is by the Metro system so that you don't stand too close to the edge of the platform. But it shows you just other ways you can die in life just to show you that, hey, you may laugh at this, but it happens for real, you know, such as, you know, putting you know, the baby in the washing machine oh, yeah. or all that kind of stuff. I yeah. don't I don't laugh at putting the baby in the washing machine because oh, I No, <laughs> but um, yeah, ba ba little, little kids have a habit to think it's interesting to climb into these things. So I can totally see how that happens. That was I I dragged my my little son when he was uh, like a toddler out of the washing machine once I, I was I made it a point out of checking every single time I can totally see how you basically put your, the stuff in there you turn around do something come back and people do that I'm very sure of that and and then you kill your baby it's like uh, I I don't think um, yeah it's it's it, on one hand it's it's kind of stupid and sounds funny but it really does happen and like a significant number of kids actually climb into these things because it looks interesting to them <laughs> so yeah city way to die scary I didn't say scary. funny I said as soon, you know as soon as you as soon as you procreate it uh, mother nature makes uh, flips some switches in your brain and the things you point to are funny to the two of you but for parents this, uh, this is among <laughs> the most scary stuff that you can imagine like the, this, in, in my mind this is like you know red alert stuff <laughs> 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 anyway so <laughs> thank you stupid ways to die i will look it up uh, i will have more fun with the uh, train station stuff all right episode number three hello everyone welcome another episode of to the bit yes we've started woohoo uh we have our two usual co-hosts we have lydia and we have dirk how are things on hi your there. ends hello. hi lydia don't we have Sebastian too th uh, today, or is it's it? Me. It's me. It's the voice out of the off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lydia. I how think are we you? should have a voice intro which introduces us, like like worldwide wrestling. <laughs> on the left <laughs> and in the middle. Who's going to be on the left, on the right, and in the middle then? <laughs> All right. So I'll be the world champion. Dirk will be the underdog, and Lydia will be the. Referee. And I'll be the referee. Yeah. yeah. That's fine with me. Okay. Neutral. You want to fight? Uh, you 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 try to avoid fights with your sister, huh? You you you're scared she gonna she gonna wipe the floor with your ass, and everybody is there to listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> he knows we, will have, <laughs> we will have an unbiased debate, uh, a series of three debates. I am not going to respond to that. We will see. Our audience will judge on the three themes we have today, and hopefully, we will cover three topics today. Uh, I will be watching the time so that we mm. try to get a wrap up of each of those topics. We have three things. We're going to start with, ta -da, which ones are we going to start with? Is let's start with universities. Okay, let's do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What yeah, that, about them? That would be my motion. So, um, what about them? I think universities are an outdated idea. And so they are set to become obsolete uh, in some not so distant future. That's my motion. Now, what do you think? But should we do as Lydia suggested over email that we have a very brief, maybe um, pros and cons debate? and then have a discussion. Okay, so yeah, uh, my answer to that, are universities uh, obsolete? I think in their current form, I would say yes. 
a definite yes. They need to evolve, but they still need to stay separate parts, not become immersed into the professional world. So if if that's the sense of the motion, that universities are no more adapted to the professional world, then I would say no, universities are not, um, are not dead and they need to stay separate. But so I guess you said yes, but no, and that's the wrap-up of that debate. Let's go to the next motion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm making fun of you. I'm the right? referee. I'm neutral. <laughs> ah, I see, I see. I don't know. I've, I've prepared pros and cons for every motion, so I'm happy to take either side, or we go straight to discussion. Come on, come you on. pick your favorite. If you, I mean, uh, Lydia gave you a yes, but no, so you can pick whatever you want. I'll, I'll do a no, but yes, then. <laughs> now this this short this short temperature check works beautiful beautiful is it? <laughs> i will pick a site all right i'll pick a site i will say they are outdated um and i'll have two or three reasons for that one youtube has everything has all the content you need maybe not hyper specialized content but then if it's not youtube you've got books you have 125 million unique books which have been printed since the Gutenberg invented the printing press. You have all the knowledge in the world in YouTube or in books or the wider internet. That's all you need to know. Just pick and choose. Now, you could say in some cases you want to have universities for a framework. Right? People you know, will not maybe do their homework or study if they haven't maybe some kind of a tutor or a teacher or professor, or maybe just the sheer psychological pressure of, hey, I spent $100,000 in this university and I better make a good investment out of this money. So if universities were a good uh, area to actually learn those skills, then maybe they would not be outdated. But from the experience I personally have, from the experience I have gathered around me, I think they're just not working. Why? Students are just not even attending class. Even if you've paid for the thing, people are proud, for the most part, to skip class and still get the degree. And let's face it, even in the most prestigious universities, now I'm not talking about exceptions or bright students who are actually attending, but I think for the most part, nobody gives a crap about what happens at university. So even if you're uh, talking about the principle of a university system, it actually doesn't even work well in practice. That's about it. I can talk more, but I want to, since we're three, I want to stop here as to why I really think they're outdated. So, Lydia was the yes, but no. So, what is your take? Would you go with the arguments of your brother or disagree? I'm going to say uh, universities are not outdated. Um, of course, YouTube has all the knowledge uh, in it, but um, you don't learn to learn through YouTube. What is the purpose of university? It's to create citizens. It's to create a critic mind, to have people who with who are in capacity to actually, um, yeah, have a chain of thought that is coherent uh, on specific subjects and be es experts. The purpose of university for me is not uh, specifically to prepare for uh, professional uh, markets. Uh, it is separate from the pro professional markets. Uh, it, is, is, it is science, it is knowledge, but it is also confronting your point of view with others. And you can't do that through the internet. You can't do that through YouTube. Even if universities need to evolve because they need to be more open, uh, more, uh, more open to all classes of people, to everywhere in the world, the knowledge needs to be more accessible. And YouTube is one way of doing this, but does not replace having actually a venue for meeting experts in your field and for confronting yourself with your peers and confronting your views with your peers. So I think, no, the university must evolve, yes, but it is absolutely not outdated. We can't do without universities. So this is actually the core point why I suggested that motion. I do think the things that you describe as we need them, I go with that. You need knowledge, you need mentors, you need experts, you need research. All of this is true, right? You need to teach people how to learn. I, however, think university are not necessarily the places that deliver that. So, to the point, YouTube gives a lot of knowledge, 
I agree, most of the time not to the level of detail that you would need to sustain a university degree. However, there are alternatives, like, right? There are independent trainings, there are certifications, there are mentorship programs, there's plenty of stuff that's outside the university happening. So that's not necessarily tied to universities. And to the contrary, I would argue right now universities serve as a barrier for a lot of people. In some countries, a solid university degree is prohibitively expensive. And uh, if you're not having the money to go to the high class, in air quotes, university, then you're, you're, you're basically also limiting the, the jobs you get. So basically, it's a barrier designed to keep people out of high paying jobs to some extent. The lower your class, the less money you have, the more effort you have to pay to educate yourself anyway. So you could argue it's even a blocker. Some of those universities don't do research. They leave the research to the business partners they work with. It's an institution that was designed in medieval times in order to distribute the knowledge that was in the hands of the clergy, in, in essence, to the wealthy and the deserving. And I think this is outdated as hell. We have plenty of other systems in place. I can educate myself up to the roof in whatever uh, sparks my fancy and do that cheaper. The only difference between a university degree and other forms of acquiring that knowledge is that the university degree right now has a reputation of letting me into high-paying jobs or demonstrating my ability to do research. It's a self-sustaining system, right? Because universities exist to protect those degrees, the degrees are that uh, that stamp of approval. I rather rather prefer us moving on from there and finding other ways to structure these type of learning journeys. Sebastian, what do you think? Yeah, you have a point on the on the last one, indeed, which I completely neglected. That is, it has this recognition. So, if you were to give practical advice, you know, to young kids today. Uh, I'd be hard pressed to tell them not to go to university, right? And that's the, the paradox of my stance here, because even though I think universities, for the most part, are useless, I would not tell someone not to go to university, and that's the paradox here because of that self-sustaining system. I do agree with you, Lydia, on and and I think that's what you, all, you also said, uh, Dirk, about the need for a place for human contact and group learning and having someone to guide you to develop critical thinking. Is that a university place? And that's also where I think it's not the case. It should be, but it's not. And I, you know, maybe there are exceptions. Maybe there are some universities, some school systems that actually work. But from my observation, from everything I've read, it's not the case. And by the way, there's nothing preventing people. It's not necessarily easy. I'm not saying it's easy, but nothing prevents you from actually forming these ad hoc teaching groups you could find other learners or professors of some kind that don't have to be university professors or coaches or mentors or tutors in different ways. We can reinvent this world. And it really feels that universities, even though they have this aura of prestige around them, and undeniably, it is prestigious when you go to some of these buildings, especially in Europe, right? they're very, like, it's architecturally it's very interesting. So there's all this weight of history. So you, you can feel it if you're really sensitive to architecture and history, you feel it. But don't be fooled, right? We, we're in 2021, and so many skills just go outdated are very, very quickly. And by the way, if we get into the details of things by that, brings me to another topic which just popped into my mind, and Lydia will probably smile when I talk about this because of a side project. I don't think universities even prepare you for the skills that actually are transversal to your life, and that's soft skills. They actually focus on that precisely the hard skills for the most part, which are the ones getting obsolete very quickly. <laughs> maybe, maybe, indeed, it should be the other way around. Focus on all the things that will be useful throughout your life. Have to work in a team, and you can only do this if you're actually in a real-life situation of working with other students develop negotiation skills, communication skills. And it's very little, uh, there's very little emphasis for the most part, as much as I can tell. So indeed, again, I have to, to go even more towards that aspect of a system which is outdated. Lydia. Yeah, so um, again, I think uh, in what you say, you say that the, the skills that the university um, teaches go outdated really quickly. Saying that, what underlines that stance is that the university is supposed to prepare for the professional life. 
And this is where I disagree. I think, again, the university is... Uh, uh, t today, there is uh, the, the boundaries are being blurred between university and industry. So you have to decide whether you consider that university is prepara a preparation for a job for industry, for, for a marketplace of jobs. If that is the case, then indeed, micro -cert certifications, uh, business-oriented uh, training are much more efficient than university. But for me, that is not the purpose of university. The purpose of university is, of course, to be in contact with the society, but not in an um, efficiency-oriented way, but more in the way that it is a, a place of developing a critical thoughts uh, in different specialized disciplines. And so, of course, there are risks and there are challenges that are inherent to how universities work today. But they do not make this place outdated in the least. I mean, we, the world is going so fast and things are changing so quickly. And all the sense that we usually make of things are, is, is going to chaos. Uh, we even more need places like universities for uh, finding a place of ser serenity to, to think about what, what is going on and have yeah, a reflection, uh, critical think thinking about, about this. Of course, it needs to be more in contact with society. So... Yes, we need to avoid the risk of self-centeredness. We need to find ways to make sure that the link between universities and society stays very solid. Uh, we also need to make sure that uh, universities are really open to all social classes and digital learning can help to that. All these, all these are challenges, of course, but they do not make the university outdated just because there are difficulties. I'm going to stay on that because I could I'll, talk I'll about this for ages. I'll sentence here just as a quick reaction. Even if you put aside your second point about the un universities not being a necessity or preparation for the job marketplace, let's put this aside for a second. I would agree with you in principle, but not in practice. What I mean by that is universities should be the way they're, you're describing, or maybe they should be or not, I don't know, but let's agree there should be. But in practice, they are almost never that way. And it's not about challenges. It's just about even the mere fact that students just do not give a damn for the most part. Right? And I am very critical of my fellow past fellow classmates who just didn't attend classes for the mass majority and still get the same degree as me. I am still upset 20 <laughs> years down the road that these guys have the same degree as I do. Right? And right. again, I will stand by my paradox. You know, If I were to go back in time, I would still go to university because of this stupid degree, which is this passport in life, even still today. So I agree with you in essence, for the most part, but not in practice. And maybe I'm more cynical about the state of uh, how people are attending universities. Dirk, your final words. Yeah, I, I'm a fan of studying things. So I hold several degrees, as we know, and I did that for quite late in my life. I didn't need that for my career. Actually, my career was in a good way even before I started studying on the side. However, I also wanted to have that, you know, that, that stamp, that degree in the end. Now... I would love if it would have been only about knowledge. And I do think that to some degree, uh, the universities are neither the best nor the only places to transport the knowledge. But then people who, who do want to get ready for something are forced to attend institutions they don't believe in, which leads to the behavior that Sebastian is describing. So I do think... They, there are more efficient ways to get to the same places. There are there are better ways for this, but um, those are only available if university at some point are seen as the outdated institution that I believe they are. In conclusion, I guess we all have good ideas about what the university should lo look like. Let's create a university. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> See, they're not outdated then. Exactly. Well, we we all... call it something else. They need to evolve. <laughs> But they're University not outdated. We need, okay. we need that space. All right. I think that was a healthy debate. Let's go to the second motion. Second motion. This is yours, Lydia. We're going to talk about Trump. Just kidding. We, we, <laughs> I'm saying Trump because for four years we had Trump in what, every one out of four debates. Yeah, and we so know you miss days. him. You miss him. Maybe we should. I miss him like crazy. We sparkle, we sparkle <laughs> a Trump debate in for you next time. I'm joking. All right. The motion is, you want to say it, Lydia? It's yours. So political branding does more harm than good. At branding, you mean advertising? 
in, with branding? Political branding. Uh, all right. Okay. Well, I guess I will have to throw away my preparation. <laughs> 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 What do you mean by branding? Can you be specific? Because branding can, can mean a lot of things. You mean advertising, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean advertising, if that, <laughs> that makes you happy. <laughs> no, come on. Ex explain explain to, to our listeners who may, may not be familiar with marketing terms what branding means in this case. So um, when we say political branding, we talk about applying uh, marketing strategies to pushing uh, political ideas or p political people, leaders in the public opinion and having uh, an effect on voters' action. So creating a political brand is making it so that when you talk about a certain person or a certain political party, you have an emotional response, which is, of course, we, tr we try to make it positive. Okay. Dirk, you're going to pick a side? So do you believe political branding does more harm than good? Contrary to what Lydia in her positive worldview framed, branding and marketing is not necessarily about making something positive. Branding and marketing is about getting people into an emotional response and into action. And the action varies, unfortunately, based on, and that's where the political branding comes in, the political agenda comes in. So some parties may have a, a, see a real tactical benefit if people get angry and potentially violent. Some parties want to paint others in a certain light. And so there is a whole range of things that can be driven by branding. Now, we there were times where this was actually not as dangerous because the way to brand people was to go to discussion, see them speak and see see posters of faces somewhere in the public space and maybe read articles in your favorite left or right or whatever leaning uh, newspaper. But these days we live in the in the time and of the hyper targeted advertising where you can basically tailor make uh, the message and the type of engagement and the the channel on and the, the way how you poke somebody's emotion. You can tailor that to the individual. That means that it becomes less visible what a party and a politician is using as a way and means to influence public opinion. You kind of quote unquote brainwash people into a mode that you hope benefits your agenda. And that is dangerous because it leads to sometimes violence, it leads to mis uh, wrong decisions. So there's people have a history of voting against their interest. And I would say political branding and advertising has a lot, a, a large part in there. And uh, yeah, it's it's actually leading to a place where at some point the, the entire system breaks down with the discourse and then we are starting over again, which I right now could actually live without. So Sebastian, what is your stance? You don't leave me the choice. I will have to be against the motion. Polit political branding is fantastically good for everybody for your uh, even at the cell level at the atomic is it, level is it so hard to say dirk you're right of course as always and then be done with this <laughs> no okay all right moving on <laughs> moving on i have i have uh, four or five points to make um if you ban if, we're not talking about banning but let's assume we're talking about banning political branding and marketing and all these strategies. People are clever. They will always find a way to manipulate opinions, to manipulate people. So it just moves the goalposts to just find another strategy. Fair enough. You may be muting it. You may be diminishing that marketing appeal, but it's actually the problem will, or the problem will still remain. Now, okay, let's put this aside. Let's, just, let, let's assume that this is not even about banning it and we have it and we want to assess whether it's good or not. As for a lot of things when it comes to expressing yourself, where do you draw the line between saying this is acceptable and this is not? Where is the truth and where is eh, kind of an embellished truth or an, a, a blatant lie? It's so difficult. And we know this for so many different things, even when it comes to humor, when it comes to the freedom of the press, you know, what can you publish? What can you not? So it's always this difficulty of drawing a red line. So I'd rather have, and I know it sounds maybe extreme, but that's the stance that you can have that I tend to try and have, and that's I don't want to have a red line. If this is freedom of expression, 
it's important to hear from political parties, however they want to communicate. And indeed, what you can do, though, and it's maybe a nice wish, but you can maybe educate people to be able to decode one of these marketing strategies when you're trying to sugarcoat things or brainwash people. Now, that's maybe a nice wish. Maybe it's back to the university system. Lydia was talking about developing, developing critical thinking. Were you not? That's an example. You should be able to have enough critical thinking. And if you still believe that propaganda, you're an adult, right? Now, that may, that may sound very much libertarian, and it is. Believe that people are self-responsible and deal with it, right? You can decide for yourself whether this is a good, bad, evil, or good, and, and then you can form your opinion. Whether this is a negative ad, then you should discard it, or it actually has merit because it's actually illustrating a point about the opponent. So all in all, difficult to draw a red line. Even if you ban it, there will be further ways to manipulate people. And we're not even talking about science fiction, but I could. Right? Like imagine you I don't know, develop some chemicals and you put this in people's food. I don't know, I'm like, I'm, I'm inventing. I'm the crazy scientist right now. Let's say and we it, make it, up a pandemic and then we, we give the chemicals as like a that. fake uh, vaccination. All right, you, you, you mix some, some German beer with some bat blood in China. You give this to Brazilians. You create a very strong South African variant. I can bet you it will trigger some emotions on the planet. Mark my words. Lydia, what are your thoughts? I would say that political branding does, does not do more harm than good. So I would say a no to my motion, um, because <laughs> even though it is true that it can be seen as a shortcut, uh, an oversimplification of complex debates, it is true. It is also true that political branding, uh, using marketing st strategies on the political scene, uh, means there are more links with business, both economic and symbolic because we use the same methods. This blurring between industry and, and politics is, is a problem. So I can see cons for political branding. But at the same time, there is a decline in political engagement. There is a decline in voter turnout in party uh, identification for decades now in Western democracies. And using branding can create interest and rally support for bad ideas, but also for good. There was a campaign uh, in the US for uh, I will vote campaign, uh, w which was effective. So, of course, political branding can be used by populist parties, but it can also be used for progressive parties. So you know, don't shoot the messenger, basically. It's not because uh, a method is used by for, for, for evil that the method itself is evil. Also, uh, one point that I want to make is that the biggest problem with political branding is that Basically, we only talk about branding. We don't talk about ideas anymore. That, that is not a fatality. That is also the commentators that are to blame for this. The fact that media are only talking about, oh, um, I don't know who put this, uh, this, this image on, the, on a campaign uh, saying it was England, but actually it's Germany, or, or ha, 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 they used a pink bus to have female voters. I mean, we don't care about, about this, this kind of comments. The problem here is that the media coverage for uh, political campaigns is focusing on this branding perspective instead of focusing on the the actual debates underlying it. And so I would say it's not the branding that is a problem. It's the quality of the, the political debates in the media focusing purely on the marketing, uh, branding stra strategies of this of that or that candidate instead of focusing on the quality of the ideas. And on that point, uh, and I'll finish with this, it has always existed to do branding. Uh, it's communication. We need to develop criticism about how this uh, affects us Uh, and and go back to to the idea the political ideas underlying it. So again, it's not the method that is to blame, but the the ideas that are that are pushed uh, using it. So I would say it is not doing more harm than good, um, but we need to 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 use it as a force for good. Dirk, any response? And then I can I will add two or three points that go yeah. against what I said, but I will stand by my. Stance, but it's just to help you That's because confusing. you're isolated. That's confusing. Not sure if I can handle that. Now, I keep hearing, yeah, this has been always the case. We always did branding. Now, the way we do branding changed. 
And, you know, as it has always been done to do branding, it's always been true as well that people fell for it. So claiming that, oh, this has always been done, it's about time that we learn how to read it, never worked so far. I have no indication that humankind became smarter overnight, so I guess we are stuck with it. Um, what are alternatives to unleashed political branding, which is kind of what we talk about? We basically say unfiltered. We, we want to allow it, right? Right. So maybe there's a need for some ground rules that reach into how we do marketing and how we communicate. It's communication in the end. You're right about that, Lydia. And, and regulates a little bit how much branding power is actually present. Um, why am I saying this? There is there's a tendency to to kill the very necessary debate because we have shortcuts in our bra mind formed by branding. I'll give you an example. If you're left-leaning, then you want that all the immigrants into the country and you're soft on crime and you want to legalize Mariana and all of these things fall into one bucket. If you're in the US, you're probably also pro-choice and you want to have gays married. That people put all of this in the same bucket is not the result of a discourse and a discussion and people having exchanged arguments and maybe allowed nuances. This is the result of decades of a decades of branding in the same directions. You can do the opposite. If you're a right-leaning politician, then you're probably tough on crime. You say it uh, as it is. You're plain-spoken. All of these things are basically so anchored in Western democracies by now. And they are not true for the politicians. They are too less nuanced. They are too black-white. So the reason we swallowed all of these stereotypes and have to actively fight against them when they come up is because of branding. And therefore, I would say branding, yes, There is, it's a very powerful and dangerous tool. I'm not saying that it should be banned as a, as a hypothetical Sebastian said earlier, and I don't, don't think any of us would claim that banning is the right uh, approach. But I do think it's too dangerous to go unwatched and unregulated. Um, and um, yeah, the danger is very real because in the end, it, uh, it has the potential to kill democratic systems in the end. Sebastian. Um, there's, there's one more thing that I would say, I think it's a bit connected to your, the ground rules that you're talking about. And I would just complement this by saying the problem with branding when it comes to politics and marketing strategies is that, and I think Lydia, you touched upon this briefly about private interests and money. And the problem, it becomes a race to whom can spend the most, which creates uneven and unfair gameplay. And for that reason, I'm, I would be in favor of regulation because of the perverse incentive multi, from multiple perspectives, multiple stakeholders, by the way, not just the political parties, but indeed the lobbies, but also the publishers, the one which display the ads, right, which may have an incentive to display more and more of these ads because they could be more high, higher paying. In fact, Facebook, just if not to bash them, just a mere fact last week or two weeks ago, Uh, lifted the block of political ads on its platform, right? Uh, after having temporarily uh, blocked it, so I think the perverse incentive of money is not something to be neglected. So that that would be my only point about to complement the ground rules. And and I'll just finish with this. So humans have not become smarter overnight. True, but I do expect some criticism from media, and good independent media does this critical work work. So um, so it is possible to have this view of what is happening on the political scene, including the political branding strategies and how they are used for triggering emotional response, etc. You said also that there are some some oversimplifications of what it means to be left wing or right wing. Uh, of course there are these simplifications, but today it isn't even re relevant anymore because there is not There is no party identification anymore. We see people voting uh, right wing and next next uh, election voting left wing and and switching swinging votes uh, at the at the individual level. Uh, so today, uh, even saying that uh, there are oversimplifications uh, in our minds about what a party s symbolizes, uh, maybe it's true, but it's it's not even relevant in the in the political debate anymore because people vote for an idea and not for a party. And about this uh, idea about the incentive to spend the most, in many countries, uh, rules exist to cap the, the amount of money that you can spend in a, in a given political campaign. So 
uh, rules exist in, in most countries, maybe not in all of them. I don't know about whether it's the case in the US, it's the case in France. I don't know if it's the case in, in Germany. Um, so, so these are my, my, my three points I wanted to react to. And I want to add two arguments for uh, political branding. Accountability. Because we are treating politicians and political ideas like we are treating a purchase now, because of all this merchandising, uh, branding, etc., there is also more accountability. Voters will make you pay uh, dissonance with what they were expecting. Uh, so I think in some to some level, it is actually good because of the, there is no not this traditional uh, party ide- identification and that we are voting for one idea. If this idea that was promised does not uh, deliver, uh, if the leader does not deliver on this promise, then uh, the voter is, is not going to stay um, loyal to him and is, is going to make him pay, go in the streets, uh, make him hear that uh, that this is uh, this is unacceptable because I purchased, I voted, and you did not deliver. So this would be one more argument in favor of branding, of this treatment of political, um, of the political scene. And the other thing is that political branding is also uh, merchandising. And I think that is also something that is more positive because merchandising can spark a conversation. It shows political engagement. And in a society where political engagement is going down, then showing that um, that people are engaged can can motivate others to to reflect, to 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 get information and maybe to engage as, as well. Yeah, I would add these two these two arguments in favor of uh, political branding, accountability, and merchandising as a way to spark conversation and as and to to finance in a more uh, diffuse way. Cool. So now from from this one third debate. The third debate. Yeah. Sebastian, what did you bring to us? All right. Uh, my motion is simple. We're talking about currently the vaccination against COVID across the world. So I guess most people, if not everybody, will relate to this. And an increasing number of countries are having discussions about forming a kind of vaccination passport to allow you to do things And if you're not vaccinated or if you don't have your vaccination leaflet with you, you may be blocked from doing a number of things, whether in your own country, maybe accessing restaurants or cinemas or whatever, or even traveling. So the motion is the COVID vaccination passport is not democratic. For or against? Dirk, you start. I don't think it's anti-democratic. This, first off, it would mean it's a new phenomenon. Ever, ever desire to go on one of your business trip to Asia? There are plenty of countries where you, if you go to on vacation there, you already have like a requirement to get vaccinated. Now, this is to some extent this is already the case. The second thing is, um, actually, I would say part of the definition of being democratic is that you that you as a society come to a collective agreement. And if the collective agreement is that you want to make it mandatory and you want to have a passport for this maybe as a way to promote vaccination, then this is something to be respected. Democratic decisions are not always decisions I like or you like or everybody likes. Democratic decisions are decisions made by a democratic process. And if those decisions come to the conclusion a vaccination passport is the way to go, then this is a democratic thing and it's uh, it's it's fine. As is to demand people having a driver's license before they can drive a car. And uh, um, as is uh, to demand that people are uh, training, uh, receive training in dentistry before they are allowed to pull your teeth. And this is just another one of those instances where we have a discussion process, a debate, where we hopefully come to an agreement as a society how to deal with it. But uh, in the end, yeah, that's what it comes down to for me. Lydia. All right. Uh, well, I will say that it is undem- undemocratic. But even before answering the question of whether it is undemocratic, uh, I want to to say that it's not even efficient, or at least it's probably not even efficient, uh, because we have no idea how long the uh, immunity is going to last if we do get a v- vaccine. Uh, so even in the sanitary point of view, a pass- uh, vac- um, vaccination passport isn't even 
it isn't even clear what purpose it's going to serve. Is it dangerous? Yes, uh, because we don't have enough vaccines. It's going to, to create a, a discrimination uh, at national levels today. And uh, and even if uh, in Western democracies or in rich countries there is enough vaccines uh, for everybody, it's going to create a discrimination at the international level because there's not going to be enough vaccines for everybody in the world anytime soon. So it's dangerous on a, on that perspective. And it's also dangerous because uh, on a national level, this is we're talking about a passport, an ID document. So there are no safeguards in current legislations around the world to prevent discrimination on jobs, access to services, or anything like that because of a vaccina- uh, vaccination passport. And so this is very dangerous on that perspective. And a passport is something that is administrative document. Uh, I, I see absolutely no uh, problem in saying that the vaccination needs to be mandatory. Uh, but it is very different to say you, you must get vaccinated and we are giving you the means to do so. We are giving you access to the vaccination, uh, making it free. This is one thing. Saying there is a vaccination passport, which is an identification document, is a way of making it mandatory without saying it and has many negative effects on discrimination and access to to jobs. And also people, it it might even be counterproductive because let's say it's an immunity passport where you have either vaccination, a counterindication to vaccination or uh, acquired immunity. And you get this vaccination passport, whether you have any any one of the three. This this thing happened for real in the the 19th century in the US. Uh, The the, um, uh, yellow fever, is that the name in English? Fievre jaune. The the yellow fever uh, came came to the U.S. and because there was not enough access to vaccines and it was such a disaster, you needed to show that you had immunity to get back to work. So what did the poor people do? They actually slept in bed with dead people, dead from the the the, the yellow fever, so that they would actually contract the yellow fever. And they they preferred um, a, a probable risk of dying to a certain di- risk of dying of hunger. Either they had no job and they would starve, or they would get sick, and maybe survive and and get back to work. So I think it's it's a very very dangerous thing to mix access to jobs, services, and uh, sanitary um, uh, information on people. And I'm not even going into protecting uh, private life, the the liberty to to go to to to, to move around in your own country. Uh, these are fundamental rights, and I'm not even going into that debate. So, Sebastian, do you want to go first, or can I react because it's itching? Go ahead, react. All right, a couple of things. Number one, uh, you said you're fine with making it mandatory. Well, then you have to find a way to prove that you actually got the vaccine if you make it mandatory. So I think um, you over-index a little bit on what it means to have a passport. For me, that's uh, actually just a proof of being vaccinated. And believe it or not, the exposure notification systems prove that there are technical ways how you can bind things to you as an identity without the privacy nightmare that you were pointing to. Now, you were you were pointing to a number of scenarios. Yellow fever is actually an interesting beast. Yellow fever almost stopped the building of the Panama Canal. If they wouldn't have found back then, it's a very interesting re- um, history lesson. I will not go into any depth there, but I encourage our listeners to actually look it up. It's an interesting story. But the there were thousands and thousands of people dying while building the Panama Canal of yellow fever. So it was a really very serious disease. In comparison, COVID is a walk in the park. Now, having said that, there's one crucial thing that you kept pointing to. There got to be a chance that you can get vaccinated. Now it doesn't. It doesn't matter. At some point, you will. You could also make an argument. You instead of making it a passport and, and demand a proof of immunity of some sorts, you could make it the other way around. Like you can say, I'm making it completely free. But if you're the cause of, for somebody else to get sick and potentially die, you're you're responsible, and we we sue you, and you're you're supposed to pay for that because you you damage somebody else's livelihood. Would be an alternative 
way of trying to do the same thing, which in the end is making it safer for everyone to get to a public life. Now I get that you're you're antsy about this and that requires a, having a chance to actually get vaccinated. It also probably requires some rules what you do with that passport. But just bear in mind, even today, every business out there has a right to limit who they left that in. They have a right to set their own rules, what they want to do with uh, with information given within limits, granted. And I would say it's actually fair if you, you know, that happens today. If you're an airline carrier, it's too much risk for you to leave uh, people um, unvaccinated traveling to certain countries. So you demand a proof of a vaccine before they even board the plane sometimes. And that is fine. You can do similar things for certain types of activities you could for instance demand that people either do a self-test before they come to the workplace or demonstrate that they are immune why not you could say you only go to the soccer game of your favorite soccer team if you either prove an immune or you do a self-test that would be an alternative and how do you prove it through something like a password why not i don't see the anti-democratic part in that i also don't see the the doom scenario there i get that it was bad back then in the u.s but there were plenty of things bad in that time not only in the u.s and hopefully we evolved a little bit our systems out of trying to balance this a bit better um just because something is dangerous doesn't mean that you that it's that is anti-democratic or should not be done at all because it that this would be a way out into a careful opening of society without uh, while we still have people that are unfortunately not vaccinated yet i believe it's a classic utilitarian versus libertarian debate whereby if you're a utilitarian you're, you're going to look at the whole of society and um, you're going to neglect the freedom of individuals and specifically in this case and this is where maybe there is controversy is um, the the passport, uh, the vaccine for sure would potentially save lives. Would the vaccination passport have the same effect? I don't know. I I I would think it it would, because you would assure that indeed people are maybe less likely to transmit the virus, although we don't have firm proof of it yet. So if you're utilitarian, you look at the average happiness or the average, I guess, number of lives still or human beings still alive, as opposed to who are going to die. So overall, if you're on that side, then you'd say, yeah, you need a passport. You want to save lives as much as possible. You'll do everything you can. But then on the other hand, indeed, like you don't really know whether it's a guaranteed immunity. We have variants which seem to be, you know, quite strong. You know, the South African one, I believe, maybe the Brazilian one also may have some a stronger resistance to some of the vaccines. So we don't have a full picture yet. So it seems to be jumping the gun maybe a little bit too fast. It's maybe not exactly like the yellow fever vaccine, which is required in some countries. I have been to Nigeria. If you don't have your yellow fever vaccination leaflet, the, the yellow leaflet is actually yellow, then you'll get a jab at the airport. And trust me, you probably don't want to have a jab at, at the Lagos airport, right? And, and I love Nigerians, and it's a very interesting country, Nigeria, but I would feel a little bit uncomfortable getting the same syringe. I'm joking, of course, but <laughs> what do I know with all the passengers who have not been vaccinated? So it is indeed something that does happen already around the planet for some of the diseases which are well known. And if you're not, then you are not admitted in that country or you get a mandatory jab. This is this is the fact. It is happening. So um, it whether COVID is at the same stage of other viruses, I don't know. And this is where maybe we're jumping the gun a little bit too quickly in terms of defining you know, and having that, that kind of passport, especially if there's no alternative, right, in terms of, oh, can do I have to have the vaccine or can I come with a PCR test, which shows I'm negative, right? If you have a range of options, then maybe we can actually go and proceed with this because it gives the ability for people who don't have access to the vaccine, which is, I guess, the three of us at the moment, for instance, to actually have the another option to go around that hurdle, and we may still have access to the same things if we can show a negative test. So maybe I restricted the debate too much at the beginning by only talking about the passport and other range of options that could be considered. Yeah, I was about to say, um, by the way, sorry, Lydia, for just say this, of course, we, we don't debate right now if it's even useful or if uh, a, a, a passport right now should happen right now. I actually with you that I wouldn't do this right now. I don't think we need it. I don't think it's useful. I don't think it's helping. But uh, the, the, the debate is it's anti-democratic. 
That's fair. And that's that's what I say it's not. It's democratic. It's a question of how we decide to do it. I think uh, this is... So, yeah, the, the debate was, is the vaccination passport uh, democratic or not, uh, and and the subject was not about a, a vaccination record, uh, like it is for the yellow fever, for example. So the, that that yellow leaflet you were talking about, Sebastian, earlier, is not a passport. It is a separate doc- document. It's not an, an administrative um, identification document. It's a separate medical document which says I have received the the, the, the vaccination that allows me to go into this country, and and I do I I. I think this is important because regulating international dissemination of a disease, yes, of course, but not through a passport, through this international uh, document that already exists. Why create a new document? No, I, yeah, sorry. Maybe the debate, I, maybe it's my mis, miswording. I'm, I was not referring to an actual administrative p- paper, right? I was, I was referring to the leaflet. Some form of proof, I was yeah. actually thinking. Yeah, some so form this, of evidence. This, sorry. So it's this not- leaflet uh, exists, and it's okay to say that to 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 have international, uh, to, to move around internationally, maybe we need this. But a passport is an identification document and can be used uh, intranationally and not uh, internationally, not only. Uh, and so this is where I think there there is a, a big problem. And of course, there can be additional requirements for certain jobs. Okay, but then they have to be discussed as well. Uh, putting information like this into an, an, an administrative uh, identification document, I think is very uh, dangerous because today this, this kind of sanitary uh, requirements um, apart from certain very specific jobs like uh, medical jobs there is no legal area no legal uh, element that, that um, makes sure that there is no uh, undue discrimination on sanitary uh, uh, criteria so so but how do how does how does a medical proof document prevent you from that if i'm if i'm an employer and tell you you got to come if when you want to want to come to the office you have to show me proof that you're immune full stop then does it there does is, it matter if you have a passport secret. or a, le- a yellow leaflet there is a medical secret you are you there is medical secret the, an employer cannot ask this from you yeah but if but it's you written could, on you your could, id card so I try to understand what your point is because if uh, if as a society we decide this is okay to ask, is that then the same thing for you than a a passport or are you making the yeah. difference? All right. So you basically saying it's anti democratic if we have any form of documentation that that links you as an individual to the information that you're vaccinated and can be requested by anyone as uh, by as anyone a, yes or that it can be requested for certain very specific jobs like medical jobs or i don't know or care uh, for little kids or old people uh, that certain specific jobs are allowed to uh, to have this uh, additional requirement we can discuss this but that anyone any any service, a restaurant, uh, uh, any kind of job can ask this from I mean, you. This there are, there, for me is a problem. There are school and daycare centers in all over Europe, and I know in Germany that that will not let your child in if you have uh, if you miss certain vaccinations. And uh, uh, that's beyond yes, the point. If then, I, okay, I agree with okay. that or not, but uh, so but what's is, the difference then? They the difference proof. is that um, so. I, what I what I'm saying is that I'm okay to make it mandatory. I'm okay to say you're not going to put your kid in school if he doesn't have this va- vaccination because it's written in the law that it's 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 mandatory. But making a vaccination passport is not is making it mandatory without saying it, and it's not it's not having the actual democratic debate about whether the vaccination should be mandatory or not. It's it's putting the debate under the under the rug. And saying we're going to put a vaccina- uh, vaccination passport, and we're going to ask you to present that passport in any uh, any place that is not absolutely necessary uh, that you have access to, and and so in practice, it's going to make it mandatory, but without saying it, without having the de- democratic debate about making the vaccination mandatory or not. So I prefer saying we we are going to put the we are going to make the the vaccination mandatory. And if you're not doing it, then then you won't have access to school education, whatever. Um, 
or you will have to you have to prove that you have a counterindication to vaccination, which is the case today for for the mandatory uh, vaccinations for kids. Uh, but putting in place a vaccination passport is making it mandatory without without assuming that you're making it mandatory without having that debate and especially not having that debate because it can't be mad- mandatory because we don't have enough vaccines for everybody everybody to go around so yeah i stand by unde- undemocratic and i agree that it is a utilitarian versus libertarian debate but i think that even if you were utilitarian then we're not even sure that it's efficient. So even as a utilitarian, there are too many risks and not enough sure uh, uh, gains from this. So uh, It's a question of when and uh, under what circumstance, right? So, um, but yeah. Anyhow, Sebastian, what have you done? Lydia and I are arguing. Oh, wait, it's a debating podcast. <laughs> that was the purpose, no? <laughs> yeah. I think you've 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 beaten the topic to death. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, you know, I I I, I I don't know what you know. I I see I see the various points of views, and I am not going to take a stance. We're going to leave it at but. that. Uh, but but. <laughs> I promised I have a colored interview. I have four or five questions. We're going to take turns. Um, I'm going to ask them as usual. It's a colored interview. Why? Why? Be be careful. Be attentive. I know it's at the, we are at the end, but it's blue or red. Who wants to start? Who wants to start? I have five questions. Dirk. All right. Question. And again, you can respond either seriously or make a joke, or it can be funny. I know you're you're caught off guard. You don't know the questions I'm going to ask. And I'm German. I so cannot be try, funny. Try to be imaginative or creative or serious. It's completely, completely up to you. Question is, blue donkey or red elephant? And I'm, of course, referring to the Democrats or the Republicans because their logo is the donkey or the elephant. So blue donkey or red elephant? Not sure what to make out of this. Part of my brain right now tries to understand what is the more common answer in these questions because uh, it also sounds like something where statistics probably um, jumps in. Well, I could also say you have a red shirt and maybe the red elephant would be. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I take the red elephant. That. Red elephant it is. <laughs> All right, Lydia, you already anticipated. Blue pill or red pill? Just to remind you, the blue pill is if you want to re- stay in the ignorance, the happy ignorance. The red pill is you want to have the desire to learn potentially a life-changing truth blue pill or red pill and you can explain your your answer you can be funny you can joke or you can answer seriously blue pill or I, red I stand, pill i stand by my position on universities red pill knowledge is good <laughs> okay even if it's a life-changing even truth, if it's yeah and you're unhappy it's and good, miserable for the rest hurts. yeah okay. even if it hurts all right truth. Is good, even if it's not adapted to real life and to social life, and even if it makes you unhappy. Truth All right. Is good. So we got. Uh, it took me a while to come with these questions. I don't know. It came, it came through my mind yesterday. Probably not very original. So so far we have a blue donkey which morphed into a red elephant who's ingested a red pill. Okay, fine. Um, Derek, question to you: Cold blue or red hot? If I pull the same analogy from earlier, that that's kind of weird. Cold blue. Tell us why. Because I had read earlier and I like opposites. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you At didn't least... say that the, the reason had to be smart or anything, did you, Sebastian? Well, did you just say I gave a dumb reason? <laughs> I think I Lydia just that. may have snuck in a, a little bit of a judgment uh... <laughs> here. <laughs> that will be the debate uh, for the next time around. <laughs> Right? Yeah. We'll debate for and against. Well, what is the debate then? Is Dirk really dumb or did Lydia <laughs> say Dirk is dumb or was that a dumb <laughs> reason or shouldn't Elevent uh, Elevent I think we elephant have three debates then. <laughs> yes. That's it. We have three debates. Done. Mm-hmm. We have our program for next time. All right, Lydia. Question for you. Blues or red? Blues, I refer to the music type, genre. And Red is actually a music band. I did look it up. And it's country music, country pop music. So blues or red? Blues. Why is that? Give us an explanation. 
I don't know the specific band that you're talking about, but I'm more sensitive to blues music than to country music. I guess you're miserable, right? You want to have the red pill so, yeah, because you want to have the, the life-changing pill. truth. Sorry. So, and feel yeah, miserable with some blues music. Okay, so exactly. we have two red and two blues. Derek, you have the final question I had for you. These days, are you feeling blue or seeing red? <laughs> uh, uh, I see more often red these days than feeling blue, but I'm 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 moving between those uh, those two two poles. Do I need to pick one, or is it okay to move between those two? It's fine. You can answer whatever you want. It's not yeah, like see, a life or death question. There's, is that, there's no right answer, right? That was the last one. I so don't I have, have one for you. Today. Oh, do you know what red versus blue is? Excuse me. Red versus <laughs> blue is. Yeah. What is red versus blue? <laughs> I just uh, I will it. answer purple. <laughs> <laughs> purple. All right. So I challenge you and all the listeners to go to YouTube after this uh, episode and type in red versus blue. And what you're going to find is a a series of videos that are produced with within the game engine of Halo. Red versus blue are uh, the you know the Halo character with a helmet and everything, and so it's like short videos where you see people interacting, and the, some of them are darn funny. As it's really it's good good pastime watching. And I had to think about you you asking all those red blue questions. Red versus blue was the thing that jumped to my mind when you started with that. Are so. these videos an hour and a half long? They are pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so is the, this what you're I think, be I think the, the watching with your son tonight uh, while, you can, while you eating can, junk food? <laughs> yes. Well, actually, most of them are shorter. So um, you can start with season one, episode one. That's four minutes. And the title, and that's very philosophical and deep, is Why <laughs> Are We Here? <laughs> so... It's a question the, I'm asking myself a lot challenge, these days. This is the one, th that's the one video you're going to watch today. And it, yeah, I think this is like the answer to the all the questions, the universe, and everything. You know, exactly. I was about to say the same thing. Forty-two. All right then. So that's a wrap. What do you think? <laughs> I know. Everybody's like stunned. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there a conclusion to your red, red or blue interview? And why we are now? There's no conclusion. It's uh, life is blue and red, and you gotta pick and make choices sometimes. Lydia, Lydia, it becomes probably soon a running guess that one of the next episodes you and I need to your question for the last one. But let's see if it's next episode or the episode after that, or maybe the episode in a couple of months. You forget one thing. right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> just to let you know. You need to prepare. <laughs> and that means. <laughs> <laughs> so is it is it like this? Um, uh, Running through. Did they use something today? <laughs> My birthday was a year. Was a year ago. <laughs> 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 His birthday was last year, the 11th of March. <laughs> I I stopped having birthdays a while ago. It's like you know, birthdays. I'm 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 counting my years now in like decades. Every decade, one birthday. <laughs> one, two, huh? one or two decades. Birthdays. You can do yeah. multiple birthdays. Maybe I do 10 birthdays in a row every 10 years. That's, that's going to be a wow. more than a week of celebration. Right? Like, uh, that's anyhow, like, I think it's more like 10 days. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm the, I'm the, 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 the dumb one here. <laughs> I'm not enough to the university <laughs> to do that. <laughs> anyway, it was a pleasure. Thank you. By the way, one, one thing I also thought about the last
this episode, we ask our, our listeners to ping us their opinion on whether or not we should do an in-person meeting in Clubhouse. Wanna guess how many people think that? <laughs> <laughs> What? Come on, come on, tell us. I like a dream. I think Sebastian is right. Exactly no one felt the desire to let us know that they want to meet us. Do you want me to be? Uh, I can be. Anonymous. Yeah, anonymous. Yeah, so, with a fake name, like uh, uh, Linda or something like that. Right? <laughs> something very, very simple. <laughs> No, so uh, it turns out the good old post podcast format. Yes, I mean, turns out we said if only one person pings us, we try to organize a listeners thing on Clubhouse. My my personal pet theory with myself was nobody gonna ping, and that's exactly what happened. <laughs> I, I did get a ping. Actually, you, you did hey. get a ping. Yeah, I now did. Now you say it. Wait, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> it was to request an invite. <laughs> So, True story. Hey, that person is a listener, so I'm not, I'm not going to make fun of, of them because they do listen to our episode, otherwise they would not know that we have invites uh, to cut hands if people want them. So, at least it was useful. Yeah, so that's, that's good. I, I think um, we will at some point do something with our listeners' life, but uh, maybe we have to decide with how and where and what. I, for one, I followed a couple of things for a while now, it's a little bit too... That's fine. Anyhow, that's to repeat myself. If you feel like there is room for some live debating something something, um, or if you have any other feedback to share, if you feel like, hey, Dirk is not as dumb as Lydia made it sound, so uh, here is what he could have said if he would have been as smart as me. And uh, if you feel like uh, uh, sharing your opinion on any one of our topics, I know we are actually quite eager to get into conversation with our audience. So feel free to share. We are always very happy. Last time we all we got a ping that uh, that was specifically addressed at Lydia, which she answered as well. So I think right to you. Um, so keep it coming. We are happy to engage. Uh, yeah, with that. Thank you, Sebastian, Lydia, for. Uh,